So I'm Liz Beth with Truva. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Quality and Innovation here at Avisure, and I'd just like to welcome you all to our webinar on keeping the suicidal patients safe. So we did have over 700 people register for the webinar, so you are, your audio is all muted, but you have the opportunity to type any questions that you have in the Q&A panel. And we save some time at the end to maybe answer some of the questions that come up very frequently. And then if your question's not answered, um, please send it to us at info at .com, And we'd like to just keep engaged with you. Um, let's see, is there any other? Yeah, we have a short exit survey at the end to make sure that our ongoing um, programs keep improving. So if you have the time to take that, we would appreciate it. Um, before I hand it over to our guest speakers today, I just wanted to explain a little bit of the backstory about why it is that we at Avisher have found ourselves kind of in the middle of this national discussion that's happening about this topic. Um, originally, 10 years ago, we started the telesitter solution that was primarily focused on fall prevention and sitter reduction, but, um, and, and that, goes very well, and there's a lot of evidence about, about this fall prevention and sitter reduction, but we get a lot of questions over the years um, of hospitals saying, yes, yes, we've decreased our falls, we decreased our one-to-one -one sitters, but lately, we've had a big increase in the suicidal risk um, need for one-to-one -one sitters for suicide risk patients. And we've had, uh, over the years, many hospitals have added suicides to their inclusion criteria for telesitting, but what we haven't had is many um, sharing publicly, either presenting or writing articles or studying it until now. Um, so we know, we know that it's happening a lot. We, for those of you who aren't aware, we have a database called ORNA, which stands for Online Reporting of Nursing Analytics. And over half of our customers um, participate in that database, and Beacon Hospital does too. So they'll, they'll be showing their ORNA data metrics, but what we can see from the aggregate is that um, in the past several years, there have been over 10,000 patients monitored primarily for suicide risk across many hospitals. Um, so now we're at a point um, where not only Beacon is sharing, but also um, I thought anybody on the line would be interested to know um, about um, Brigham and, um, Brigham and Women's Hospital is also just published research, which I just got an email from Dr. Cole on February 2nd that this is now available to be searched on PubMed. So uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital also uses telesitting um, for suicide risk patients, and um, you can search their article. There's a citation at the bottom. And um, the, our Beacon friends have read this article too, and there's some interesting um, differences and similarities in um, the, how these patients are kept safe by um, telesitting. So we have this IRB approved research study that kind of supplements the presentation that um, Sarah and Molly will be given today. Um, so I am so excited to hand it over to Molly Kelly and Sarah Podorowski um, from Beacon Memorial Hospital. Molly Kelly is the director of their um, summit center and Sarah is the Vice President of Nursing and Clinical Services there. Um, so thank you so much for um, coming up here to Grand Rapids and um, sharing your story here on this um, webinar. Hi, um, my name's Molly. Um, I, Sarah and I come from Memorial Hospital in South Bend, which is a part of Beacon Health System. So we actually um, have three hospitals and we are building a fourth hospital currently. Um, we're, we are at Memorial, a level two trauma center. Um, and we operate 225 adult patient beds, 144 women's and children's beds, 66 behavioral health beds, um, and 40 emergency department beds. Um, we do not use telesitting at our behavioral health facility, so I just want to make sure I, that I stated that. Okay, so um, in 2014, we introduced telesitting at Memorial Hospital and at Elkhart General Hospital. Um, in April of 2016 um, is when we started monitoring our low acuity suicidal patients. In January of 2018, we launched some um, 
a team called the Behavioral Emergency Response Team, um, and that includes a nurse, which I'll explain later how they play a piece of this. And in October of 2018, the Joint Commission visited. So um, the beginning, um, we knew, so even though we started monitoring um, via telesitter in 2014, we still had a lot of use of one-to-one -one sitters. So um, we knew we needed to better, we needed a better allocation of our resources. We needed to optimize all of our cameras and make sure we were using them. And then we needed to make a financial impact. Um, and the one area we felt that this was possible with, with our low uh, risk, um, low acuity, low risk suicidal patients. Um, for example, an 83 year old patient who is with femur fracture who, um, you know, stated they want, they wanted to die. So those are the patients that we felt like maybe did not need full one to one monitoring, but there was some use with the telesitter. So um, we utilized a multidisciplinary team of frontline staff. Um, we evaluated our current processes. We um, evaluated patients allocated um, to one-to-one -one observation, and we attempted to do to, to differ, differentiate our levels of risk from a suicide um, perspective. And so we did a total policy revamp. Um, we chose wisely with our assessment scale. Uh, we implemented room preparation checklists to mitigate our risk, and we um, also wanted to make the documentation easy for staff. Um, so from our policy, um, we had multiple existing policies um, that, that guided staff um, or didn't guide staff um, on how to care for our <laughs> suicidal patients. We were inconsistently um, following these policies. Um, so we, and we also had two major patient safety events despite these policies where we had risks even with one-to-one -one, um, sitters at the bedside. Um, so we knew um, from, this, uh, from this policy review that we needed one policy to guide staff on managing the suicidal patient, and then we needed a policy to help guide the telesitters on the appropriate patients for observation. So Sarah's going to talk about how we did this and what tool we used. All right, so Molly mentioned that we did a total policy revamp, and when we did that, we really asked our frontline staff to take a look at what the current practice was. So we actually pulled a list of everybody we had done a one-to-one -one observation with um, for several months. The list was very long, and patients were on the list like the ones Molly mentioned, the 83-year-old who made a statement in the ER about her femur fracture, if the pain doesn't stop, I'm going to kill myself. Well, in our facility, if you made a comment that alluded to suicide, you were going to get one-to-one -one observation. So we really pulled that list of patients and tried ourselves to delineate who had a high risk for suicide and who was a low risk for suicide. And what we found was we probably needed to find somebody else to guide us in the assessment. And so we really um, went on a quest to find a suicide assessment scale that delineated out risk level. And in our, you know, we did a Google search like, what, like most people do to try to figure out what's out there. And we found a lot, but the one we found that really felt like the right one for us was the Columbia Suicide Scale. Part of the reason we felt like it was the right one for us is because the Joint Commission said it was the right one for them. And so we knew that that was probably a smart move. So we then really moved our thought process into understanding that scale the best we could so we could launch it at our facility. Um, and the, there's a couple really interesting things about the Columbia Suicide or as you'll hear us talk about the CSSR. Um, this is a scale that was built by Dr. Posner, and it, there's many iterations of this scale. You can use this in outpatient practices, in the inpatient acute care setting, the behavioral health setting, and for us, we um, needed the acute, the acute care focused assessment. For those of you who are maybe Googling it right now, it happens to be the assessment that starts with question number two. There is no question number one for the scale that you use in the inpatient setting. And so the thought behind this scale, the whole premise of it is having conversations with patients to really figure out where they're at in their suicidal tendencies. Um, and it, it's easy, it's very few questions, it's a conversation, and there's a rating scale associated with it. And so we really, we chose that scale, and then we really moved into how do we embed this into our EMR, our, our electronic medical record, so that it was easy for staff to use. Um, and uh, just some things to note about the CSSR as a side note, um, and you'll find this when you go out to the internet to find more information. This is a free assessment, 
um, this is a copyright free assessment. And so once you put in your information to the website, Dr. Posner gives you all, all access. You can add your own logo to the forms. You can embed it into your EMR. You kind of have free reign use of this tool. And so that made it very easy for us as well. And that's because the whole idea from her is that we want to keep patients safe and that we want to have better conversations with patients about suicidal tendencies. And so she comes from a really great place in the creation of this scale. Um, and even if you don't choose this one, and I'm not employed by her, so just kind of sharing our thoughts and our experience. But um, I encourage you to go out and read about this because it is a great guide of communication with patients when they're in these situations. So we chose the CSSR. Also mentioned that one of the things we wanted to do was make our documentation practice as easy as possible for nurses because for those of you um, who are in electronic medical records which is probably all of you probably you hear at least once or twice a day how nurses don't love their documentation um, and so we really wanted to make it as easy as possible so we have some screenshots for you we are a Cerner hospital and we use iview on our departments, and so what you're seeing a screenshot of is the direct, it's right out of our iView charting. And so this is what it looks like on the left-hand side. The blue text is reference text. So when our nurses click on that, um, you'll see it in the next slide, not quite yet though. Um, when they click on that, they get prompts for how to have the conversation. But the smaller right-hand side, which maybe you can't see that well, but we're happy to share with you, this auto-calculates for our staff. And when it gives the score, it actually tells the nurse they scored a one, they get a telesitter and room preparation done, or they scored a two, you need to have a one-to-one -one at the bedside. So not only is it easy for them to fill out this documentation, but when they get the score at the end, it tells them what to do. Now, we always say that nurses' gut feeling often trumps any assessment scale or score that we're going to do for a patient. So if a a patient scores a one and they get a telesitter, but the nurse has a bad feeling about what the patient's saying or kind of the circumstance they're in, it's okay, we let them trump it with a one-to-one. -one. But one of the things to note about our policy and our protocols and the program that we're running at Memorial is that we are a nurse, -driven, this is a nurse-driven protocol and assessment. Um, so a little bit different from the white paper or the research article you saw referenced at the beginning, which is very physician-driven and wonderful. At Memorial, we've sort of removed that piece and made this very nurse-driven with physician blessing. Um, we have a very strong psychiatry team and consult service in the medical world, and so they can come in and they guide us and we have conversations with them. But the way we allocate one-to-one -one resources at the bedside is very nurse-driven for us. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that the nurse knew kind of what was expected at all times. So when you click on that blue reference text, the next slide is going to show you um, the pop-up box that you get. So the nurse clicks on, has the patient had thoughts of killing themselves, and the reference pops up and it says in red, this is how you should say it. Since someone last asked you, have you had any thoughts about killing yourself? And as you click through the questions, which you don't see here, but it just keeps flowing for the nurse, it really does guide them in the conversation they should have with the patient. Because this scale identifies, is the patient having suicidal thoughts? Do they have a plan? Have they thought about implementing the plan? And they do they have details on how to do that? And so it delineates risk in addition to notifying us that there's an issue to begin with. So there's suicidal thoughts and there's ideation with tendency. And so this scale really helps us identify both of those things. The other thing we did, and this is a very big key to our success, not only do we feel that way, but the Joint Commission has told us they feel that way as well. When you have a um, telesitter at the bedside for suicidal observation, um, it's the difference of, from having somebody at the bedside is the response time if something were to happen. And we were asked this directly in our survey this fall. So what happens if the telesitter sees something with the patient and they hit the alarm? How long does it take for someone to respond at the bedside? And what do you do to mitigate the risk between that time? For us, it's less than 14 seconds, and you're going to see that in a little bit. So what do we do in that 14 seconds to help keep the patient safe? Well, we feel really strongly about mitigating risk on the front side. So when we're getting a patient from the ER up on the floor and they get notified that they're a suicidal observation patient, we do room preparation. And our policy has the checklist as well as all of our departments. And so they go into the room and they remove all of these things you see on the screen. There are no extra chairs, extra linens, the hand sanitizer, utensils, pens, and pencils. You won't find those things in the rooms where we have suicidal patients because those are risks. 
And so we mitigate the risk by removing the items. So it makes it safer for us to um, take care of the patient. That's a big deal for the Joint Commission. They want to know that people have plans in place to mitigate the risk that exists in the environment, and this is our way to do that. I'm going to pass it back to Molly for a few slides here, and she's going to talk to you specifically about um, that frontline staff that do the telesitting. She happens to be their manager, so a great person to talk about it. So our frontline staff, our, um, our telesitters, are patient care assistants. They are, they are the same patient care assistants that are sitting one-to-one -one at times at the bedside. They're also, um, the, patient, the patient care assistants also um, work on the unit, so they have a relationship with the staff on the unit. So we feel that that's actually a big key to our success. They're the ones doing the room prep at times in, in the, um, for those patients. Um, so, so they're very much um, in tune to what's going on on those units. So there's a good trust and relationship with them. Um, we train the patient care assistant uh, with the policy. So, and and um, as Sarah showed in the documentation, you know, we keep that policy at the forefront of the day-to-day -day for, for the staff. Um, as you can even see in this picture, this is Lilia. She's watching patients and um, she is sitting right next to the education for the telesitter, so we keep it right there um, at the forefront for them. Um, we also have created a safe room in our validations for our patient care assistants or our telesitters. Um, so everybody goes through the process of um, walking through the safe room and identifying any risks. So we make sure that that's done yearly um, with their validations. Um, we make sure that they're very aware. Um, we've had many times where the telesitters are calling the units and um, and and um, talking to the staff on the units about the risks that are still present in the room. So there are even a third check um, for the room prep for a lot of those patients. So that's been very successful. We watch um, up to nine patients um, for any particular reason. We intermingle our suicidal patients with the other patients that we watch. Um, we do keep a one to nine ratio. We feel that that's the best option. There are times where we'll go up to a one to 10. Um, really, that depends upon um, the other patients that the telesitter is watching. Um, and I feel because our patient care assistants or our telesitters, because they're so in tune with um, taking care of the patients on the unit, that they actually um, are very able to tell us when they think a patient is, you know, higher acuity, if they can handle that 10th patient or not. Um, so that, that's um, keeping that relationship is good. Okay. And then um, I did talk earlier about the BERT nurses um, or the behavioral um, emergency response team. So we have a 12 hour a day, six day a week RN um, who is in the hospital responds. Um, so they can respond to a charge nurse request. Um, they can respond to um, our, our violent patient code, our security assistance code is what we call it. Um, but really the goal is to be able to get the BERT nurse up to the unit before we actually have to make that overhead call. Um, they are psych um, critical care, so they they're, um, they come from our adult acute uh, unit at our behavioral health facility. They're trained that way. Um, they proactively round on patients, so there'll be patients um, that they that they know um, are are aggressive because we use a MOAS scale, that's the modified overt aggression scale, and they'll get a printout daily of that scale, and the the high risk patients um, will be um, on their radar to round on daily. They, like I said, they round on any RN requests. They respond to the calls. Um, they are also ed educating the staff on our Columbia Suicide Risk Scale. Uh, and they also do training. So when they are, um, they're auditing charts as they're seeing patients and they're making sure that that Columbia Suicide Scale is being filled out properly and consistently. So they have been really a key player in making sure that we are following our policy and everyone's um, having some consistency with filling out that scale. One thing, I just want to pop in about yeah. the BERT nurses. So when we mentioned that they do continuous education about the CSSR with the floor staff, that's, a re that's been a really important piece for us. We actually launched our BERT nurse program from a need we saw with workplace violence. And so they actually started for a whole different reason. But what we have found is that they, they are a resource that we probably couldn't live without at this point on the floor when it comes to all things behavioral health. Because like most people, 
um, in the medical world, that staff is not really used to dealing with behavioral health issues. And we know that the conversation around suicide with patients, it's tough. It's hard for people to feel comfortable with that. And so for us, we have a resource every day that can help guide the staff and the conversation. Sometimes they help with the conversation at the bedside with the patient and really show by role modeling how that works. And so that's constant for us, although they'll tell you maybe the constant, theme, the constant need for education maybe doesn't feel as good to them as we are thankful that we have the resource. Um, but they spend a good amount of their time dealing with um, education and helping our staff get to the point where they feel a little bit more comfortable with that conversation. Yeah, we're at the point now that I don't think the nurses would know what to do with us, the partners <laughs> anymore. Um, so they're, they're extremely helpful in our hospital. Um, so next, I want to talk about the emergency department. So um, we use a, scre a screening question in triage in the ER. If they, um, if they answer the question a certain way, then the CSSR actually um, pops up and we're able to then continue on and, and um, complete a CSSR. Um, so within that, we have room prep in the ER as well, uh, very similar as Sarah showed and talked about before. Uh, we have an observation level assigned based off the CSSR, just as we would on the inpatient unit. Um, and we've actually dedicated one of our telesitter cameras to stay in the ER so that it can be used. Um, you never know what's going to walk into the in the door of the ER, and we need to have that available 24/7 um, for them to use. And so it lives. They they've named it also, so it lives there in the department with them. Um, and I'm going to pass it back to Sarah. She's going to talk about our joint commission. All right, so um, we mentioned right on the slide with the Joint Commission um, the latest TJC R3 report, and I hope that everybody has a copy of that. If not, our friends at Avisher are happy to share it with you. They have a copy as well. Um, these are guidelines that we all need to meet by the middle of this year. Um, I believe the Joint Commission is giving guidance that by July 1, we need to be able to meet the, the things listed here on the screen. Um, so remove risk from the environment. So for those of you that are already doing environmental um, risk assessments, awesome job. For those of you that aren't, I encourage you to start to look into how you'll accomplish that. Um, they want you to assess the risk for suicide for patients. So you have to use an assessment, an evidence-based, um, verified and validated assessment tool to assess the risk with patients. Um, for those that screen positive, you have to assess the suicidal ideation with a validated tool. You have to be able to document the risk in the record. You have to have your own written policy on how you'll care for these patients. Your policy must address the discharge and follow-up care for this population. And you have to, of course, their favorite thing is audits. And so you have to monitor your implementation and the effectiveness of your own policy. They, um, the Joint Commission did get a little, give a little guidance on the assessment tools um, in this particular instance. And the CSSR is one of four that they recommend people adopt. And so we're thankful we made that choice a couple of years ago. And um, we recently did have our visit. And this is one of the frequently asked questions that we get when we talk about our suicidal management with telesitters um, is, has the Joint Commission been there and what did they think? Um, because we do tend to hear that there's barriers for people that the Joint Commission might not think it's okay to use telesitters to help with observation. And I I'm, can tell you that they, they loved our policy and they felt very good about our telesitter use for these patients. And that's because we do the room um, prep and mitigation and because we have a validated tool to assess the risk level of the patient. And so they felt very good and very positive about how we delineated risk and how we guided patients towards, or guided our staff rather, towards what type of observation does the patient need based off of the risk level from the assessment. Um, they commented that they, they love what we're doing with our telesitter program. Um, we did um, have a pocket um, department where we weren't following our own policy on how to manage these patients. And so they didn't like that. They said, we like your policy. We just want you to do it all the time and be very consistent with it. Um, and so we have worked really hard to get to 100% of audits of following the policy exactly as intended. So um, we feel really good about that. Um, when we started doing um, telesitter for low acuity suicidal patients, we hadn't had our joint commission visit, and so we kind of took a leap of faith and worked really hard to keep our patients safe with what we know and what research guided us on, but it does feel really good to know now that what we're doing is um, what they're saying is becoming a best practice for organizations, because it is hard, and it is um, financially hard, and um, 
staff wise, we know staff are not at a pre, you know, they're at a premium. And so the way we allocate resources has to just work a little different. And so this has really worked well for us. Um, our continued opportunities. So with anything in healthcare, um, there's a constant need for education. And we talked about that a little bit with our Burt nurses helping us out with um, always educating people on the CSSR scale. That conversation's difficult. So the more you can work with people to feel comfortable about it, the better. Um, we know that room preparation, I think it's always going to be a thing. Um, we have, we do a safe room in our RN and our PCA, our patient care assistant validations. We set the room up to be unsafe and they have to go in and room prep and make it safe for patients. And so that's, that's always good and people like doing that as practice. But room preparation is hard. Um, patients like to have all the things and part of our policy and preparation is they don't get to have their belongings. They don't get their cell phones and their iPads and their sweatshirts and um, with strings in them and things like that because those are risks in the environment. Um, we do have the luxury of having 66 inpatient behavioral health beds and a very well-trained psych team. And so we brought them over to help us with the development of our policy so we could learn from them what were some of the risks in the environment. The, the trash can liner, if you use plastic trash can liners, those can't be in suicidal patient rooms. They are a ligature risk. Um, and so those are things that I don't know that we would have found out on our own as quickly if we didn't have them. So um, those are always going to be things we have to venture back to. We change our meal trays to not come with metal silverware, and we know that we have to keep on top of that to make sure it happens. But the biggest one, that's the reason it's in all caps for you, is the bathrooms. Um, this is true with high fall risk patients um, and suicidal patients, regardless of how we're observing them, either telesitter or one-to-one, -one, they cannot be in the bathroom alone. And so when we have a telesitter watching the patient, if the patient has to go to the bathroom, the telesitter has to call the floor staff and let them know so they can be in the bathroom with the patient. Um, one thing to always know with the Joint Commission now and moving forward, their attention to suicidal um, risk patients is very, very high. They'll tell you, and we learn very quickly, it is safety before privacy. And so the patients who are at risk for suicide, they cannot be in the bathroom alone. Molly mentioned we had two very serious patient safety events that kind of pushed us into looking at our practice, and both of those safety events um, and suicidal attempts with patients happened in the bathroom. Um, patients know what they're doing. Um, they put a lot of thought into some of these things, and so the bathrooms are, are a hot spot and a big opportunity, and so we are constantly working with our staff. I know the patient says they won't do anything, we have to be in there with them anyways. And so safety before privacy. Um, a couple other things that we've learned is that with high liability patients, our staff are extra apprehensive. I know for those of you who manage nurses, you've heard maybe a nurse or two say, it's my license. Um, uh, they like to say that we all love our license and we like to keep that safe. Um, and we hear that a lot more when we start to do things differently with high liability patients, um, but it's okay. And we coach them and we educate and we use research, but the number one thing we do to kind of combat the staff apprehension is we include them in the solution. And so when we look to make big policy changes like this, we use um, a multidisciplinary team of frontline staff to help guide us. They do the work. So we like them to help us design how it's gonna flow. Never stop educating your staff and use your resources. If you don't have a big psych facility, I encourage you to find folks who do and utilize their expertise. They look at environmental risk differently than a lot of people. So when we do our suicide risk assessment on our environment in the medical world, we utilize our behavioral health team to help us do it because they look at things differently. Ceilings, trash can liners, all the things like that. I'm going to pass it back to Molly. She can talk a little bit about the ORNA data she mentioned earlier. Yeah, so um, this first slide here you can see is our telesitter usage. So the top bar, um, the brighter bar is our data. Um, and this comes from ORNA and it's compared with national data. Um, so our, you can see we have 58% of our patients um, are being monitored for falls. 18% um, are medical device interference. 11% suicide versus a 7% nationwide um, percentage. So, and then we have 5% of other. And we've observed approximately 500 most acuity suicide patients um, since 2016 at Memorial Hospital. 
Um, this next slide here um, talks about the average length of stay on video monitoring. And this is our, all of our patients at Beacon versus the suicidal patients. So you can see on average, um, we are monitoring for about two and a half days, whereas um, our suicide patients are about one, um, one and a quarter. Um, we believe the reason for this is because we do have a behavioral health facility, as Sarah mentioned. So our goal is to get these patients to the right level of care in our behavioral health um, facility. So, um, or, or to get um, them evaluated and, and discharge them home or wherever um, the safest place may be for them. And then um, the next uh, slide uh, talks about um, our stat alarm response time. So we are, again, looking at all of our patients versus our suicidal patients. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, uh, it's very important to have, A, a quick response time if something were to happen in that room. Um, and, and what are you doing in that short amount of time to mitigate the risk? So as you can see, uh, on average, we're answering our stat alarms at about 14 seconds. Um, I believe um, through ORNA, the national average is 15 seconds. Um, and, <laughs> and then um, from suicide, we are at 13 seconds. So um, the other, the line that you see there is how many, um, how many times are we having the stat alarm the patients. And the suicide patients um, are definitely, uh, we're not having to stat alarm them very often, and we believe a lot of that has to do with the room prep that we do. Um, and, and we talked about, you know, they are a lower acuity patient. Um, however, they are um, high liability, so you can see that with the reduced um, response time for those particular patients. They're, the nurses are um, more alerted to those patients when the stat alarm goes off, knowing that they're very high risk. Okay, and the next slide that we have here is our verbal interventions. Um, again, you know, it's, it's very much reduced for our suicidal patients. Um, and we also believe that that's um, due to the room prep that we're doing. They don't necessarily have the access to, you know, to do, to um, move about the room so much and have the um, items in the room um, to, to have to set alarm or and verbally, you know, ask them to stay in bed or things like that. So they're, um, they have a lower amount of um, verbal intervention. And then um, we didn't want to, um, we didn't want to let go of our, our fall rate um, for Telesit. Um, we feel like we wanted to share that we've had a lot of success um, also with our fall, of our fall rate. Um, you can see we've steadily declined. Again, 2014 is when we started Telesitter. Um, so you can see since then we have been on a um, great downward trend. For that, so we want to make sure we share that as well. A couple questions that were frequently asked, and then I know we have some questions coming in um, today from the webinar. Is patient privacy an issue with telemonitoring patients? Nope. Our cameras don't record, and again, the Joint Commission tells us, and I'm sure they'll tell you soon, um, safety before privacy, and so we have to keep patients safe and everything else comes second. Um, so our cameras don't record, they simply are for observation. Um, so no issue with privacy there. And then how do you maintain precautions with a patient who's mobile on the unit? Um, they aren't mobile on the unit. That's how. It is safety before privacy and before experience and sometimes um, before patient comfort, comfort level. And I know that sounds harsh and I'm saying it with ease. That's because I've had the opportunity to have a lot of conversations with the Joint Commission about it. Um, we have to keep patients safe and it's really difficult to keep them safe in the hallways and kind of walk out walking around because those areas you can't mitigate the risk for. There's bulletin boards, there's tape dispensers, there's staplers, there's all sorts of things. There's exits and sometimes these patients are elopement risk and so our patients stay in their room when they're with us. All right, and I've probably said it enough times now, it's a little redundant, but our overall goal is just to keep patients safe and so we kind of live in a place where we are open to continually evolving our practice so that we can do things that are best for the patients that keep them safe, but also um, keep us moving forward with the technology available to us in the market. Okay, thank you so much. It's, um, you covered so many things and we had um, questions pouring in. Um, so I have some of them here. Um, 
first of all, I want to talk about the bathrooms. And um, since we're still on the topic of privacy, um, do you guys mind walking through um, your actual um, policy, you know, kind of a little more detailed process of what happens when a suicide, a suicide risk patient has to go to the bathroom um, mm -hmm. while they're being monitored? Mm -hmm. So if they're on a telesitter, I mean, they know that the telesitter the tele text talk to the patients, and so they may say, like, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. The telesitter says, please wait right there. Or the patient starts to climb out of bed, and the telesitter tech says, please don't get out of bed. Hang on. I'll get your nurse for you. They make the call to the nurse assigned to the patient or the PCA on the floor, and that person has to come into the room and go to the bathroom with the patient. Now, there are patients who say, I don't want to wait. And they get up and they walk into the bathroom and our telesitters will stat alarm to get the attention of the floor staff to head into the bathroom or they'll start making calls furiously, fast and furious to get somebody in there. Um, but it, admittedly, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Our floor staff, just like everybody else's, they're very busy. They like when they have a telesitter watching the patient. And so it's hard when they, somebody calls them and says, hey, you got to stop what you're doing and go watch somebody in the bathroom, especially a patient that is somewhat fairly independent at the bedside. So um, it is something that we work hard at re-educating people with. We were kind of laughing on our drive up here today. Um, I We just had a conversation with a department who um, kind of had a big miss on this this past weekend and nothing happened to the patient, but it was a kind of a big glaring risk of, hey, we can't slip on this anymore. So it still happens. Yeah, so when the nurse says, oh, this patient suicidal risk patient is okay, but I'm to go to the bathroom, you say, that's, no, it's not. That's a hard no. <laughs> no, it's a hard no. Yeah, and we do say, and I'm sure people see this, they'll say, well, um, the telesitter will call and say, hey, the patient has to go to the bathroom, and the nurse says, oh, that's okay, I talked to that patient, they're okay to be alone. Yeah. Yeah. They're hard not. no. <laughs> they're not. Okay. The real answer is no, not so much. Um, here's a good question. Um, do you put the room preparation checklist in the patient's chart or keep it as part of the permanent record? Uh, it's not part of the permanent record. We do keep it on the chart until the patient's discharged and the chart gets broken down. Our BERT nurses are doing all of our joint commission required audits for suicide. And so when they go to the floor, they're double checking the room prep checklist and the assessment scale and that the room actually reflects what's checked on the checklist. Um, and then they're incorporating that into their audits, but it is not a permanent part of the patient's record. Okay, so it's with, with the hard copy of yes. Yeah, so, okay. Um, and then here's a question that came across. Um, our facility has looked at using the CSSR scale for struggling how to stratify the results into low, medium, or high risk. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that? I sure can. Um, and I encourage, so I can talk a little bit about it, um, but I encourage you and what we did. Um, because when we first went live with the scale, we went live with it, and then we realized something wrong was happening because no one was getting one-to-one -one observation at the bedside, um, not even the patient who had a very serious attempt and still has intention. And so I actually talked to Dr. Posner on the phone and said, hey, here's what's happening. Can you help me figure it out? And she did. She was wonderful. So I encourage you to reach out to her as a resource. Um, but what we do is that if any, if the, I think the last question um, in the set of questions is, have you had an act of suicide that prompted this admission? If anybody answers yes to that, they're automatically a one on our scale. Um, you kind of get one point for everything you answer yes to. So if you are a one, you're automatically getting a telesitter. So that means anybody we've admitted that had an, a suicide attempt, pills, hanging, gunshot wound, anything like that, they're at minimum going to get a telesitter. If they had the attempt and they still have a thought and a plan to act on for the suicide, they get another point. They're going to get a one-to-one -one observer at the bedside. So it scores from the you ask from the top down and it scores from the bottom up. Um, and I'm the screenshots show that a little bit. And um, the screenshot shows you at the bottom the, how the levels kind of fall out from the risk perspective. And so it's right on there. But I'm happy to share more about that too um, with um, screenshots. And then, and this is kind of on the, along the same line, somebody said, what is that first screening question? Because I think that you asked in the The ER first thing. screening question is, since someone last asked you, have you had thoughts of killing yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And, but in the ER, it would be? In the ER, we have a different triage um, question that's not from the CSSR. And I believe um, it okay. is something like, have you had thoughts of hurting yourself? Okay. And then if they answer yes to that, the CSSR pops up. And they finish this up. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm grouping all the Columbia questions together. Okay. So this is the last one. That's okay. Um, do you have a process for reevaluating a, 
a patient after the uh, initial score is determined? Yes, awesome question. Yeah. I apologize for not mentioning it. If we do this assessment on someone because they have suicidal thoughts, we ask every shift for the duration of their stay. Mm -hmm. Every shift. Oh, every shift. Mm -hmm. Every 12 hours. Every 12. Okay. okay. And then, um, do you screen all patients in the ER setting or just those who present as behavioral, or having a behavioral mental health issue? Yeah, this, is a hot, this, this is a hot topic. topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a hot topic. Originally, the Joint Commission said you have to ask people with risk factors. Right. Mm -hmm. And then hospitals got to decide what were risk factors, what does that mean to us. And now the Joint Commission says you need to ask everyone because the patient who's most at risk is the patient with no risk factors because nobody's looking. Um, and so now they say you have to ask everybody that triage question. Okay. So we do. Um, and then I think it's kind of a related um, question, but I know in every state it's called a different thing. Um, uh, 5150, I've heard, 72 hour hold, mm -hmm. finger act. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what it's called in, in, in mm -hmm. uh, your in Indiana, but mm -hmm. um, can you talk about those types of patients? Mm -hmm. Um, our 72-hour detention patients, or Baker Act patients, it's kind of, we call it 72-hour detention. Um, if they are detentioned out of the ER for a suicidal risk or for a behavioral health situation, we are trying to get them disposition to our behavioral health site nearly immediately if they don't have any medical criteria. Our um, psych facility does not have medical capability, so if they did ingest a large amount of pills or something where they would need to be medically observed, they go to our patient, our regular medical floors. Otherwise, we're trying to disposition our 72 hour detentions to our site facility very quickly. We actually have a less than 120 minute um, ER stay for behavioral health patients. Well, yeah. So we're trying to disposition quickly. Yeah, we are lucky there. We are. <laughs> That's true. Mm -hmm. um, and this one may be for Molly. Um, are your patient care sitters and your fellow sitters licensed nursing assistants, or, or what kind of personnel do you hire for that position? So they actually just, re they require a high school diploma, and then we do on-the-job training. So we have a very robust um, training program for our patient care assistants that they go through. Any new patient care systems, uh, patient care assistants that um, come into the hospital go through a week-long training, and we have a group of nurse educators who run that training, um, and then they do validation and get validated, and then they're trained on the unit then at that point, okay. so depending on which department they go to. Um, the, the one, the particular um, telesitters are actually float PCAs. So they um, are assigned out wherever the need is. So they're going to all the units um, in the hospital, essentially. And then they're the ones also that are doing the telesitting. Okay. And another question for you, Molly. Um, are your sitters allowed anything or telesitters allowed them anything <laughs> with them um, while sitting, such as books mm -hmm. or other reading material or phones? Um, that's a hot topic. Um, that's very, you know, there's, there's that balance. <laughs> there's the balance between um, sitting for 12 hours in front of a screen and, um, you know, and keeping your sanity versus keeping the patient safe. And obviously keeping the patient safe is our priority. So we have just recently, um, we, so we've taken um, the internet off of all of the computers um, and, and they do not have their phones. And, and they are told, you know, if they are seen with their phones, they're told to put those, their phones away. So that's a, our policy is to not have the devices. Um, and then, uh, and then we, we actually had a nice conversation about this um, this morning was about, so when you showed your data about the verbal interventions per patient mm -hmm. day and the fat alarms per patient day, they were um, more, more times that the telesitter had to verbally interact with patients and more times that the telesitter had to use the alarm with patients who were not suicidal. Mm -hmm. they, they, maybe the dementia or traumatic brain injury, um, uh, substance use withdrawal patients um, who were fall risk or elopement, that kind of thing. So how do you, and this question is, do you have a rotation of patients that are more difficult and less difficult. And, and what I'm kind of thrown into the mix, you know, we saw that telesitter with nine patients or 10. Mm -hmm. um, are they a mixture of suicide risk patients along with your your regular fall prevention mm -hmm. Alzheimer's patients? Or, or how do you yeah, and make even that out. Mm -hmm. So we do. Um, we we really go off of kind. Um, we we assign out. We intermingle the patient types. Um, whoever has an open camera takes the next patient. To be honest with you, but like I said, um, the patient care assistants because they're um, they're have so much experience in the hospital. 
um, they're very good about talking about patients that are too acute or mm -hmm. if they're feeling uncomfortable. Um, and we share a space, so they're in a space with the house supervisor. So they're, um, I think they feel very comfortable escalating any concerns that they have. There is a process in place, you know, the, the nurse, the charge nurse, and no response, then they escalate to the house supervisor, and they work through that very well. Okay. It's that relationship piece, I think, that has that we've been very successful because of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question that I think maybe I can feel too. It is, um, how exactly do you track the staff response time? So I, we showed um, data in ORNA, and Dr. Kroll also talked about the alarm response time in, in his article, and that it actually comes straight from the software. So mm -hmm. when a telesitter is using the software, and we certainly didn't want to take time to do a software demo today, but when they're using the uh, telesitter software, they trigger an alarm, and it continues until they visualize um, a, a nurse mm -hmm. that responded to the room, and then they deactivate the alarm. And so that, that time lapse between activation and deactivation of the stat alarm is how um, we're able to precisely track the, um, the um, stat alarm response time. And the, the national average with, I think, we have 15 million hours of data now is about 15 seconds mm -hmm. for the stat alarm time. And there's some interesting research on um, call light response time, which is in the minutes. Uh, is measured in like four minutes and 18 mm -hmm. seconds, I think is the average mm -hmm. call light response mm -hmm. time for that. And, and congratulations to you for being below the average. So mm -hmm. you, I heard that little plug, you're like, I think <laughs> <laughs> 15 seconds and we're 14. It's the best people. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is something we're celebrating. Um, oh yeah, okay, so, uh, and that was, that was, I got two or three questions on that. Um, what, how it works and can the telesitter talk to the patient? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, how important is talking to the patient? Oh, yeah. well, it's very important. I think, yeah. you know, creating that communication is that first step in trying to redirect the patient. Um, and, and once you're not able to communicate at that level, then you go, you escalate to, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about alarm fatigue and nursing, yeah. right? So communication is definitely the first best step, um, the best first step to be able to help um, reduce the need for the, the stat alarm. We also have all of the nurses' phone numbers um, in the patient care assistance phone numbers on the unit. So we use those to, um, as a second step, too, if the patient isn't um, cooperating. Perfect. Um, two more questions, I think, I'm going to throw out there. Um, uh, are your cameras portable or fixed in the patient room? They're portable. portable. On wheels so we can move them wherever we need them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So with the amount of beds we have, I think that's the best option for us to be able to be as flexible as possible and, and to be able to get the most population. Okay. And um, Sarah, you're going to love this one. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Um, we are very concerned about ligature risk. Uh, what are your thoughts? Do you have any thoughts at all about ligature? <laughs> I got a lot. I got a lot of thoughts about that. Um, I have kind of not two camps of thoughts, but two, two kind of buckets um, in our inpatient behavioral health space. We did have to work really um, vigorously and tirelessly to fix some um, ligature risks that we did not foresee in our risk assessment when the Joint Commission showed up. Um, and so we spent some extensive time doing that, and I'm, I'm happy if people want to reach out to me specifically about that environment. Um, and the ligature risk in the medical world is a growing concern for the Joint Commission because suicidal patients are everywhere, and like most places, um, on our, our population of patients, our patients with secondary psych diagnosis is probably hovering around 50 to 60% of our inpatient admissions. And so the risk is high. Not all behavioral health patients are suicidal, and I'm certainly not suggesting that, but I am suggesting that the environmental needs for these patients are a little bit different than what we've seen historically. Um, so the best you can do to mitigate risk in the room um, is, is probably where you should put some effort in. Um, the roaming the halls and things like that are, that are low-hanging fruit, just stop doing that. Um, so that when you get asked what you do to mitigate risk, you, you contain to the room and you make the room as safe as possible. Um, we have the opportunity to build a new hospital, like Molly mentioned. Um, and so we are doing some things a little bit differently with that new build because we simply have the opportunity. So in the ER, we're building a behavioral health room. We have the garage door that covers the head wall, and so there's less risk there innately. Um, so if you have the opportunities for new builds, I certainly think you should do it that way. When you pick out blinds for the windows, um, be very careful with the cord you have to pull the blind down. If you can do in-window shades, that's better. Um, so there's little things like that that we've kind of learned along the way. 
anytime you would hear anything to the wall in a patient room, think twice about it. That's what we've learned. Um, but so I'm happy to talk about ligature risk in the inpatient space specifically if anybody wants to reach out. That's what we could do a whole webinar just we on can. that. <laughs> yeah, so we won't do that yeah. today. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy to help. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, I'm getting prompting from our <laughs> organizers here that there are so oh, there's a lot of O's on it. So many questions <laughs> we can't get them to them all. Um, but we're going to try to respond to questions after the webinar. Um, and I just want to say um, that we at Avisher are just kind of honored to just provide the platform to keep um, this conversation mm -hmm. going so that clinicians are able to connect with each other um, and help each other out. And so that was really very generous of you two to, to drive up here and to, to collect data and to, you know, show warts and all, you know, about what, what you're <laughs> learning and what you have learned. And um, so, and I'm just, I know there are a lot of um, people on the line who already have the telesitter, and if, and I would just encourage you to um, connect with each other. And if you're you're willing to share your story or be a reference for somebody who's just just making their way on this journey, we really appreciate being able mm -hmm. to um, share contacts like that. Um, so, uh, and then um, another topic, and this is kind of great uh, segue because this came up. You know, we we all have um, fall fall risk scales, and we talked about suicide risk scales today, and you touched a little bit on risk for aggression scales. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it would be great if we kind of kept with using all these different scales uh, to help select patients for the right amount of monitoring. And, and a huge topic that I'm quite passionate about is um, workplace safety for nurses and bedside caregivers. And um, and you guys were talking about the MOAS scale, mm -hmm. and um, so that is uh, keep an eye out. We don't have a date set yet, but we're going to have a, a webinar about workplace safety events because we do we do see that happening, and we do see that mitigated by video monitoring as well. And um, there is a short exit survey, and um, please take a moment to fill that out if you can. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys.